Hey, what's going on guys? It's Mike and I am uh, ready to do another car beam video with you guys. Um, if I, my eyes are tracking weird, it's because I'm staring at my phone. I'm trying to stare at myself so it looks consistent, but I might be like googly eyed. I don't think I'm googly eyed in person. Um, look, I want to continue to do these videos for you guys and educate you in all the things uh, I think are important in preparedness. You know, we're starting off with pistol, car beam, like the basics. For people who are new to guns, there's a lot of people who are buying guns for the first time, and I want to be sure that we do our best to educate them to kind of get them into the fold, right? If you're a comfortable gun handler with pistols and carbines, then you could join the club and come out and train with us and uh, train with other people and upgrade your circumstance by enhancing your training. Uh, but the basics are what we always need to start with. That includes safety, nomenclature, knowing how things operate. And I'm going to take you into kind of the level two version of this because I talk nomenclature, I talk basics. Um, I did open up comments for those and I got some dumbasses commenting stupid stuff. That's okay, that's expected. But I've disabled comments because I just don't like the toxicity for people who actually want to ask sound and intelligent questions. So if you are a person who um, wants to ask a question, just DM me on my personal Instagram. It's in the notes. Um, hopefully you subscribe, but it's in the notes. It's at mike.a.glover. That is my only Instagram account. I'm not in Syria. I'm not asking you to give me money so I can fly out of Syria. Um, that happens all the time to women and maybe some guys. I'm sorry about that. That's not me, I promise. Um, look. Just a little bit on mindset, you know, uh, one thing that we must do as a community is stick together. I think it's a responsibility that all Americans should look at themselves as a valued asset to their community. You know, it starts with yourself. You should look at yourself in the mirror and think that you're a valued asset. And if you're not, because you're self-assessing yourself, then you need to take the steps necessary to make yourself better. If you're obese, if you're overweight, if you're lazy, if you um, don't responsibly think about preparedness, then you're a potentially a liability to your community, to your family, and to yourself. But it starts with yourself, right? When you wake up and look yourself in the mirror, the greatest opportunity you have is the freedom of choice because you live in such a free society that offers you so many venues and opportunities to excel and succeed. I, I came here, um, you know, my mom is Korean, she's an immigrant. Um, my dad was in the military, very blue collared, very poor growing up. And I didn't have a crap ton of opportunities, but I had enough to set me up for success. The only reason I have the opportunity to talk to you, and I guess you pay attention to me, is because of my experiences in committing myself to something. In this case, it was the military, it was service. Find that something, whether it's service uh, to your country, to your community, um, first responder, or just being an entrepreneur. Whatever it may be, find something that you are passionate about and stick with it. Gain the value add and the experiences and take advantage of those opportunities to make yourself better. When you make yourself better, then you can make your friends and family around you better. And if we all think this way, which is just simply thinking selflessly, um, even in our own decision-making that affect us directly, then it just makes our communities better. And I hope that means something to somebody. Um, a lot of people don't pay attention to those kind of things because you know, they're selfishly caught up in their own lives. But if you look at yourself as a potential value add to the people around you, then you will do things like be better prepared, get an education, be physically fit and healthy, taking care of yourself to take care of others. Um, I recently posted on my Instagram at mike.a.glover some toxicity that I experienced from some guys that went and dug into my background and called me out for stolen valor. They didn't even understand, one, what I said, two, my actual background, and I think they lost context. It's disappointing when it comes from the people in my own community. It's like my, my service isn't enough to some people, but that's okay. Some people just don't get it. And 
I hope to educate those people and making them understand you're not in the military anymore. You don't work for the government. You're not in the army. You're not that big of a deal. And when you're in this world, which is the world where you're a lone operator in a world of a lot of selfish people and a lot of selfish institutions, you have to do your best uh, to stay positive, to stay focused, and surround yourself with good people. Those people who are toxic and dramatic, I don't associate myself with those people because I don't have the energy, I don't have the time, and I, I refuse to disrupt my life for people who live like that. Um, yeah, so stay focused, be positive, and always move forward. All right, guys, here we go. So the last time that we talked in a conversation, I talked about carbines. I talked about basic nomenclature. One of the things that was misrepresentative was um, people calling this a pistol versus a carbine. Yes, according to the ATF, legally, this is called a pistol because of the brace on a short-barreled rifle, which is known as an SBR. The alternative is this could be a regular stock, which isn't very different, and this would be called a carbine. For, for again, basic nomenclature and understanding, I don't care about the semantics. This is a carbine, meaning it handles like a carbine, it operates exactly like a carbine, but yes, this is a brace, and this is considered a pistol by the ATF. Um, make sure when you look at your carbine setup, you first identify the objective in which you want to accomplish with your rifle. This is not, I, I've made this point clear, but people misunderstood this. This is considered a weapon of war by some in our society. What it's not is a weapon of war. If you cycle in any weapon, I've used Ruger Mark IIs that are suppressed in war. Those pistols, just because they're integrated into war, aren't weapons of war. Meaning this in our society, in modern society, is used as a hunting rifle for varmint, for, for uh, small game, uh, even big game in different variations, AR-10s, etc. So just because it's black, just because it looks picatinny and sexy, uh, doesn't mean it's a, a, a weapon of war. This is a .223. It's a hopped up 22 round with a whole bunch of propellant. Remember, <laughs> the .223 represents, um, in, in the metric system and in inches, the size of the diameter of the bullet. So when you talk 5.56 millimeters, it's not that big of a round, um, but it is capable of doing a lot of damage like many firearms. I just wanna make that point clear because the idea that this is a weapon of mass destruction or weapon of war is ludicrous. It's a semi-automatic rifle, which most every gun is outside of uh, bolt action uh, uh, rifles. It's a semi-automatic gas-operated rifle that um, uh, is used in different variations, including sports shooting, including hunting, and yes, in, in combat. Um, so when I look at this carbine, when I look at this setup, this is set up for short distances and variations. Um, the, the point effective range of this weapon system is 550 meters. Area is like 800. This is capable of engaging targets up to a thousand meters, but you must understand that based on some limitations and they, and they vary many, um, you are not going to be as accurate out, that to, out to that distance. There is a limit on 5.56 or 223 ammunition rifles, including barrel twist and optics, etc. And generally speaking, I would say this is capable of engaging targets reliably out to three to 500 yards. And I say that sparingly because what you must understand about carbines is dramatically they start dropping off beyond 300 yards. In fact, the bullet drop for an AR-15 at 500 yards is about 50 inches, give or take. So that's, that's like five feet above the target. So if you wanted to engage a threat at 500 yards, um, you would have to aim five feet above the target to engage it because the trajectory goes like this and then it falls off because of gravity. Um, so some of the things I wanna, want you to understand is the relationship of your optic in relationship to your rifle because many people choose the right rifle but botch it by, by 
diminishing their capabilities of the rifle by choosing the wrong optic. Like this Vortex Huey UH-1 um, is a great optic, but it's a red dot. And it has an MOA, I forget this one, this is maybe 3.5 MOA. So it has a little red dot. And if you imagine you wanted to engage a threat at 500 yards and you had to float that dot above the target somewhere five feet above to engage the upper body or upper torso, that would be difficult to do. So if your objective is to do long range shooting because you want to take advantage of what a carbine is, then you would use a staged reticle of some kind to be able to have a reference point to drop or to compensate for the bullet drop to hold the reticle above the target to be able to engage the threat or the target. So that's an important consideration. One of the misnomers and misunderstandings about a carbine is that somehow it's not effective out to distance. I've actually heard people say, yeah, Mike, you talk about this engaging of out to a thousand yards, which I've done routinely. Um, I did that at Canadian Texas. I've done it in, as a sniper. Um, is it the most effective thing in the world? No, because it's very inconsist inconsistent. Because the, the hit probability, because all the variables, including environmental factors, change. Um, and it's hard to track that in real time. So if you have a five mile an hour wind west to east or left to right, then you're compensating for that. Well, when, it, when a bullet is subsonic, meaning it doesn't have a lot of energy, it's below 12, 1300 feet per second, it, it's not gonna be consistent. Um, I heard somebody say at a thousand yards, it's like getting hit in the chest with a rock. That round's not effective at killing or destroying targets. That's completely false because the Muzzle velocity of a 5.56 round at 1,000 yards is about 950 feet per second. Let's just call it 900 feet per second for the sake of math. A, the muzzle velocity in feet per second of a 45 caliber round coming out of the barrel of a hot 45 is about 800 to 900 feet per second. So essentially, it's like getting hit in the chest with a 45, but instead it's a tumbling 5.56 round, maybe, waffling or tumbling a little unstable. So I don't know about you, but I don't want to get hit in the chest with a 900 feet per second anything. Now, does it lack foot pounds energy and is that a different consideration? Yes. But what I'm saying is this is truly effective out the distance and we'll talk about optimizing that setup. So this variation, I have two variations here. I have BCM, Bravo Company Manufacturing and a Triarch Systems uh, AR-15. These two rifles are my favorite rifles. They are generally the same, meaning they are super reliable, super durable, and super well made. The tolerances between the lower and upper receiver are great. It's a free floating rail. Uh, the gas uh, impingement system is super reliable. Um, this gun is squared away and ready for whatever thing, whatever you want to do with it. Sport shooting, hunting, uh, and using it in self-defense. Remember the capability of this rifle is the fact that you could have standoff from the threat. The average distance, according to FBI statistics, of a law enforcement officer being in a gunfight with an assailant is about 12 feet. So when you think about the, the understanding of defending your life and creating space, this is super advantageous. Like I see a lot of guys running in the open on flat ranges, uh, slaloming between targets and shooting still and shooting paper. That's like a zombie apocalypse, and it's not really realistic as a scenario. Because if you told me to do the same scenario and you had a start point, I would take a knee or go to the prone from that start point, or maybe even do it standing, and engage all those threats in depth away from me, utilizing the distance away from target. Because that's your advantage, is the standoff. You have the advantage of that standoff with the right optic and the right gun. This... This particular uh, system is set up for short range, right? I have a short barrel rifle. This is a 10.3. I also have a, uh, um, a, a buttstock that's a brace, which is just a, a normal buttstock to me. And I could use this to run and gun. One of the biggest mistakes we make when, when holding these guns is we hold them like they're rifles. We barricade ourselves by pulling back with a buttstock, putting our nose in the charging handle and shooting. But remember, this is not, this is not a deer rifle. 
The reason we barricade ourselves on deer rifles is because we learn shooting from the prone. If you're in the prone and you don't want the gun to go anywhere, you barricade it because you reduce the muzzle flip and recoil of the gun so you can get back on the scope for secondary shots. So if you stood up with a deer rifle and you did the same thing, what would happen? It, the scope would hit you in the face. It'd be hard to control. It would be hard, even if you're a big guy like me, to even reset on the target. So this is not definitively a deer rifle. It has a gas operating system, which happens to be gas impingement or direct impingement. It has a mil-spec tube, which reciprocates the bolt carrier group and bolt inside of the back of the tube using a buffer and buffer spring assembly. And that recoil, you got muzzle flip, which is upward rise of the muzzle, but you also have downward movement of the back of the gun, which is the recoil. The gun doesn't do this. So if a gun did this like a deer rifle and I took the gun and I pulled it to my shoulder, what am I doing? I'm facilitating recoil. I'm helping it, right? Because it's going rearward and I'm pulling it rearward. But the idea would be, oh, it has nowhere to go. Except it does because it's so powerful, it's going to go up. But a, uh, a carbine, or in this case an M4, does not do that. A lot of the gas is dissipated through this muzzle brake or this muzzle flash. A lot of the recoil is dissipated through this mil-spec tube which has five points of adjustment, which dissipates all that energy. So in addition to that, the advantage of having a carbine is my ability to manipulate it around my shoulder in, in confined spaces. So I'm sideways like this, and I can have the gun here operating in confined spaces, in vehicles, around obstacles, around my own mates. I could do the same thing with downward movement and then driving the gun to the threat. I want to hold a C-clamp on the front end of the gun to manage the muzzle flip, but also be able to drive it to where I need it to be. Remember, instinctually, you have the ability to drive your hands faster than you drive an optic. If I'm depending on visual acuity to drive my eyes to the optic line, I'm going to be slow. But if I just think about driving my physical body, which in this case happens to be my C-clamp hand, I could drive my hand. And what happens to be there is the barrel of the gun. And if I practice that indexing, the optic is going to be in my eye line. Also, I don't want to barricade this. I want to lift it up because I'm depending on friction so the gun doesn't snap down. I just have slight rearward movement to hold pressure, or in this case, friction, but I don't want to overdo it. I also have a light grip on this hand. Over gripping will disable your ability to run your trigger finger fast. So I have a light grip, I apply a light grip, and then I can run my trigger finger fast. So the way you handle this is not like a deer rifle because this is uh, distinctly different. One thing I put on this gun is a two-point sling. I have a, a two-point sling set up which has QD dismounts, which quick detaches from the gun, which I think is very important. But I run an adjustable sling. I recommend the VTAC or uh, Travis Haley's uh, sling because it's super easy to use and you can cinch it down on your body. Back in the day, we used to do, we used to barricade this gun to our bodies. But now the idea is you want to keep it loose because you want to be able to manipulate in this space. If I can't do that, I'm stuck in my gun. If you're going to prone, if you're going to standing, kneeling, the alternate positions, then you're going to need to be able to manipulate the gun in those spaces and you don't need it barricaded to your body. The advantage of a two-point sling also is if I'm right-handed, I can take my right hand through the sling, slap it on my back, cinch this down, and then I could utilize this pin to my back um, and do building climbing, treat casualties, and the list goes on. So let's talk about optimized setups. This setup right here is 10.3 inches. There's 10.3 inches of barrel. That starts at the crown, which is where the screw uh, portion of it uh, ties into the muzzle brake. And that indexes at the, the bore or the breech, which is where you see um, the chamber, the bolt chamber, which is the front of the, the bolt, um, locks into the actual chamber of the barrel. That barrel is one piece, okay? And that's super important when trying to establish what you want to do with a gun. Back in the day in the Army when I first joined, we used one and nine twist barrels, one and nine twist barrels have been in the army inventory. It's been a NATO issued rifle for a long period of time. That rifle um, is 
good for shooting 55 grain to 62 grain because it spins it appropriately, but it's not good for pushing heavier rounds. Remember, the, the barrel twist, if it's one and nine, means every nine inches of barrel, the bullet or projectile does one full rotation through what's called lands and grooves. Lands and grooves are basically channels which grip the bullet to allow it to uh, uh, rotate through the bore and then maintain stability as it exits the bore, as opposed to a clean bore, which muskets use, where there's no uh, uh, lands and grooves to hold on or create stability in the round. So what's optimal? Well, what's optimal for this setup is one in seven twist, which this barrel is. I get one full rotation seven inches in, and then I get a little extra with three more inches. That's what she said. Um, so a one in seven twist or a one in seven twist will rotate it every seven inches. So I'll get in this 10.3 inch barrel about one and a quarter twist. So I also want to take the bullet weight, which is the bullet weight in grains of the projectile and use the correlated weight, which in this case would be 62 grain and up. Optimized with an 11.5 inch barrel, you're about 70 grain to 77 grain. That's a, that's a good uh, a combination. Here's the analogy. Uh, I hope you guys know about football or I play football. So my arm, my arm is the, the barrel in length, in speed, in twist. My fingers are lands and grooves. If I take a football and I hold this football and I go to throw the football, let's say the football is too light because it's a Nerf ball. Well, if I over rotate because I have a fast rotation and um, I, I throw it too fast, which means over rotate the, the uh, light bullet, in this case, a Nerf ball, what's gonna happen to that Nerf ball? Take Joe Montana's arm or my arm, I'm just like Joe Montana, and throw that football as fast as you can, what's gonna happen? Well, if you over-rotate uh, a lighter projectile, it's going to cause instability in the round. And you're not going to maximize this path outside of the gun called trajectory. So now let's say I get the optimal bullet weight. Let's say it's a collegiate or NFL leather football. And then I throw it. Well, what happens? If I have the right barrel length and the right barrel twist in the speed in which I throw it, then I optimize the trajectory and then I send that spiral outside of the barrel and it has a longer trajectory. So that's how you have to think about it. Lands and grooves, how I hold it, the barrel length, and then the barrel twist and, and the speed in which I throw it. But it has to mate up with the right um, round weight. All right, so let me take this uh, triarch and show you guys this. This triarch is one of my favorite triarchs. It's a 14.5 it's a, uh, a inch uh, barrel. Actually, I think this might be a 16. This is, um, yeah, this, this is a 16. This is uh, uh, George's gun. George is a bigger dude. I'm 6'1", he's like 6'10". Uh, but he's a, he's a larger guy and he wanted to go with something that uh, allowed him to reach out and touch. Now, what you have here is a 16 inch barrel. Again, it's one in seven twist. If I use an optimized round, in this case, I'd probably use a 77 grain round. I'm getting full, two full rotations and then some before this exits. So I'm holding on to those lands and grooves onto the ball and then I'm throwing it, optimizing the, the trajectory. Uh, George, in this case, also decided to go with a one to four. This is a Burris MTAC. I'm not a fan of Burris. I prefer uh, Razor HDs from Vortex or Night Force one to eights. Um, either way, this has a reticle. Actually, let me check and see if this has a reticle. Yes, this has a reticle. And the benefit, again, of a reticle is now I have an area in which to stage the reticle to be able to hold over in distance. If you zero a gun, remember there's always a 2.0. Remember when you establish a zero, like a 25 yard point of aim, point of impact, meaning you aim in a spot and you hit that spot at 25 yards, it is gonna give you a repeat zero. For 25 yards, generally speaking, it gives you a 300 yard repeat zero. For 50 yards, it generally gives you a 200 yard zero. So what does that mean? Well, what that means is in the trajectory path, it gives you a point in which your point of aim 
and point of impact are the same at 25 yards, then you have a slight rise, and then it, it falls through at 300 yards again. Now, what's the deviation between 25 and 300? It's very minimal. That's why guys do a lot of weird stuff with zeros. It's popular to talk about different kinds of zeros, but if you're only shooting out to 300 yards, you can get away with a 25, 300 yard zero point of aim, point of impact. There's slight deviation between 25 and 300. It's very slight, but when it falls through the 300, it's gonna fall off the planet and you need to be able to compensate for that. As opposed to a 50 to a 200, which gives you a, lot of, a, a little flatter trajectory, and then you don't fall off so aggressively. You're going to have to develop the appropriate zero for you based on your circumstance. I live in rural Montana. I might have a 50 to 200. Uh, if I'm, if I'm, I'm sorry, a 25 to 300. I live in an urban environment where I'm going to maximize my distance to 200. I'm going to look at a 50 to, to 200. There's Sean Ryan does a 36 yard zero. The, the zeros go on. The important thing to understand is between 25 and 300, there's slight deviation beyond 300 yards in order to compensate. So I hope that makes sense because I want you to take full advantage of your particular setup. Um, this stage reticle isn't the best. Remember, all reticles have dots or stage reticles that represent minutes of angle at distance. What does that mean? Well, that means that... Um, at 100 yards, a one minute of angle dot would represent a one inch by one inch dot. So if you had a one inch by one inch pasty at 100 yards and you went to put that dot on that pasty, it would cover the entire pasty, which, you know, pasty is just a little sticker. Um, but if you had a 3.5 MOA dot, which most dots are rated at, uh, generally speaking, then it would be 3.5 inches of dot covering a one inch pasty. So how would you shoot a one-inch group? More than likely you wouldn't because you would be covering the pasty and it would be hard to quarter that small target. That's the benefit of reticles. Most reticles are below 0.2 mils, which just means they're very small and very thin. So when you're aiming at a one-inch by one-inch pasty, if you have a thin reticle, you could divide it or quarter it in half and then shoot the upper left quadrant of that pasty to aim small, miss small. Again, uh, not thinking about these things in the context of what you're going to use it in the application will set you up for failure. I remember I shot the use of sock sniper comp in 2012 as a team sergeant, or maybe 2011. We placed fourth overall, um, first in the tactical division. All the other teams were like uh, uh, instructor or, uh, quals or instructors at um, qualification courses like sniper courses, etc. And so we were the first tactical team. We would have won that competition if I didn't have a night force um, point, point 0.2 mil, which was the, the, the reticle at a one-inch pasty covered the one-inch pasty. So I couldn't aim small, miss small. Now, I should have looked at that reticle and went, oh man, this is a thicker reticle. I should have just went with something else, but I decided to commit to it. At the time, John Noveski hooked me up with a 16-inch gas gun from Noveski, but we did really well. Um, you have to pay attention to those kind of details. Is it a fir first, focal points, uh, first focal plane scope, second focal plane? What kind of brake do you have? What kind of accessories do you run? What kind of system um, is the bolt carrier group? J uh, JP Rifles, for example, runs reduced mass bolt carrier groups. There's a whole bunch of things that you need to pay attention to when, when purchasing a rifle. Guys, I know this is a lot of information. I'm gonna keep this short because the next thing we're gonna talk about is alternate positions and setting your position uh, in stance. That's gonna be my next video on carbine, but I wanted to leave you with some thoughts and ideas before you invest or commit to a carbine. And if you did, maybe it's time to invest in a different platform because maybe you don't have the right rifle for the right uh, job. Guys, I, I appreciate you guys. Um, go to at mike.a.glover. This is my personal YouTube channel. Make sure you subscribe. If you find value, man, buy a hat. Be better prepared. I don't care. I'm not looking for anything here in return. I just want you to be better, better educated and spread that education across your friends and family to make you better prepared and your community better prepared. Thanks, guys. Until next time, stay alert, stay alive.